Hello. I'm going to talk about the evidence in early medieval Wales for corn drying kilns, which are also known as crop or grain dryers, field kilns, or as parching, drying, or malting ovens. They are an important source of information. The charred plant remains within them provide evidence of crops and of agricultural practices, as well as indicating particular activities at and the significance of their localities. They can thus help us identify the multifocal central zones that Andy and Gordon discussed last week. And they can be radiocarbon dated, which is of particular note in Wales, where, given the problems of survival of material culture, they are often the only clearly dated evidence of early medieval activity at sites. There's a relatively good body of evidence for them in Wales, and this is a refreshing change from the usual situation. Over the next few minutes, I will give you an overview of the key aspects of this evidence, which is reviewed in this autumn's Archaeologia Cambrensis in a report and gazetteer compiled by me and Steve Burrow. We've examined all reported corn drying kilns in Wales, and there's a supporting ADS archive with an expanded catalogue containing archaeobotanical summaries and drawings of all plans of all kilns where a plan exists, as well as some guidance on recording for excavators. The catalogue has been compiled with the assistance of other researchers who very generously shared their data, and I plan to keep it updated, so I welcome details of further kilns. Corn drying kilns are found at Romano British, early medieval and medieval sites. At medieval type kilns continue in use until the 19th century on farms in Wales. So we have descriptions of their operation. Here's one that has been reconstructed at the Wexford Irish National Heritage Park and which forms the cover art for the newly published 1975 undergraduate dissertation by Robert Rickett, which was the first substantial survey of the British and Irish evidence and is available as a free download from Archaeopress. You'll find a summary of the current state of research in the Archaeologia Convences paper and in Mark McElter's introduction to Rickett's work. The main thing to note here is that although there's plenty of evidence for them in England, where their charred grain and seed contents provide, contents provide evidence for Anglo-Saxon agricultural extensification, there are currently no comprehensive recent national overviews either there or in Scotland. The overall picture is clearest in Ireland, largely through the work of Mick Monk, and now in Wales. The broad picture shows that some were freestanding while others were within buildings. The slide shows reconstruction drawings of mid Anglo-Saxon malting kilns of both types. There isn't, however, much archaeological evidence for kiln buildings in early medieval Wales, apart from at South Hook, where a group of 7th to 9th century kilns within a settlement are surrounded by clusters of small post holes suggestive of fences or walls of light timber structures. Superstructure is an area that needs further research, and stake holes and burnt kiln burnt clay fragments at some sites are recorded in the online gazetteer. We don't have much evidence for the igloo-shaped clay and wattle structures shown in the much reproduced reconstruction of the High and Ferrers kiln, and many actually seem to have been open and used on dry days according to 19th century accounts. Both open kilns and kiln houses are noted in 12th century Welsh law which identifies three categories of kiln that can be usefully compared with the archaeological evidence. An Odin Biben or piped kiln within a building known as an Odin tea or kiln house, an open piped kiln not within a building, and a kiln which is not piped. The pipe, I should add, is a flue. All kilns essentially consist of a drying chamber where grains or other crops are heated by warm air from an adjacent fire. And on the slide, you can see these in a schematic cross-section of a late medieval kiln. The simplest corn drying kilns consist of a pit in the ground with the fire either in an adjacent pit, possibly separated by a short flue and or a stone baffle to block sparks, or in some cases underneath the drying crops. In the more elaborate stone built corn drying kilns, the flue is longer, reducing the risk of the grain being set alight. <laughs> 
Timber frameworks to support racks of drying grain are suggested by some excavations and by 19th century descriptions. The fire was fueled by the straw and chaff discarded in crop processing or by gorse, wood or peat. And these, as well as the crops being dried, may be reflected in the archaeobotanical assemblages obtained from the kilns. And crunch question, do we have many? The answer is quite a few. The Gazetteer records archaeological evidence for 143 kilns of late prehistoric to late medieval date, 29 of which are undated and six of which produced radiocarbon dates that, that appeared anomalous, perhaps because of the use of peat as a fuel. 42 can be dated to the 5th to 11th centuries AD, 22 of these from short life radiocarbon dated samples and the remainder dated by artifacts, contexts, litigraphy or morphological similarity to other dated examples at the same site. You can see the dated kilns on this chart, which shows the distribution for short life radiocarbon dates against the date distribution for all dating methods. It's a slightly fuzzy representation since it displays date ranges that usually cover more than one century. Large numbers of Romano-British corn drying kilns are evident, most of them dated by typology, pottery, coins or site association. For the early medieval period, there is a large cluster in the 5th to 7th centuries AD, accounting for 26 of the 42 early medieval corn drying kilns, 15 of them dated using short, heat, short life radiocarbon samples. This is a significant peak, with as, many as, with as many corn drying kilns in the 6th century AD as in the 13th century, albeit not necessarily with the same capacity. It appears to represent an apparent continuity from the Romano-British peak, though whether this is coincidental or affects similarities in practices is a question for further research. There are differences in corn drying kiln typology between these periods. T-shaped corn drying kilns are exclusively associated with the Romano-British period, with pear-shaped corn drying kilns appearing in the post-Roman period. After this, corn drying kiln numbers declined steadily over the 7th to 10th centuries, increasing again after this to another peak in the 12th to 13th centuries. As you can see from this slide, the overall pattern is similar to that of Ireland, where there have been many more excavations. Some Irish work, not shown here, suggests an, an intensification of kiln use in the 8th century, but this isn't visible in the published bar chart of Welsh date, dates, though you can see the slightest of upturns in the chart on the right. This shows work in progress, a provisional reanalysis of the Welsh radiocarbon dates using the INCAL 20 curve and kernel density estimation modelling to pull in the date ranges. The period before the 6th century is affected by the lack of radiocarbon dates for Romano-British kilns, but it shows the steep decline in kiln activity during the 7th century very clearly. A number of different types of kiln can be identified, and the Gazetteer uses classifications found in Irish work, together with T-shaped Roman kilns and a new classification that we have called pear-shaped. Kiln types have distinct period groupings and size ranges, which you will find in the report. It's worth noting that the robbing of stone linings can cause difficulties in assigning an appropriate typology. So there are 11 T-shaped kilns dating to the 1st to 4th centuries AD, and 14 dumbbell or figure of eight kilns dating to the Romano-British and early medieval periods. And there are 30 oval or circular kilns nine of them undated, with dates otherwise ranging from the Iron Age to the medieval period, though most are early medieval. There are 22 pear-shaped kilns, six of them undated. Most of the dated examples are early medieval. And there are 21 key-shaped kilns, all apart from three undated instances of medieval or later date. And there are six L or comma-shaped kilns, variants of keyhole-shaped kilns, all of medieval date, apart from one with early medieval dates from unspecified charcoal. And I'll draw your attention to two types of kilns, pear-shaped and keyhole-shaped, that need to be distinguished carefully using locations of firing areas in relation to longitudinal profile. The pear-shaped kilns are sometimes described as keyhole-shaped, 
but the location of their fire is different. In the pear-shaped kilns, it is in the deep round bowl element that in a keyhole-shaped kiln would be the drying chamber. In the pear-shaped kilns, this bowl is usually the deepest element, unlike the keyhole kilns where it is usually elevated slightly to make use of the hot air rising from the lower level fire. The drying area of pear-shaped kilns actually appears to be in a shallower, higher level extension that was previously regarded as a flue and which probably had some sort of timber superstructure to support the drying grain. So in brief, section drawings, longitudinal ones, are crucial. When we consider their uses, we need to note the different kiln processing needs of different grains. Spelt wheat is said to benefit from parching before winnowing to loosen the grain from its spikelets, though bread wheat does not need this. Oats and hulled barley both require heating to loosen and remove husks before milling, and oats benefits from kiln drying before storage to inhibit rancidity. Contrary to some long-standing assumptions, their primary use doesn't seem to have been to dry wet harvests, which were usually dealt with by careful stooking of sheaves and stack construction, even in high rainfall areas like Shetland, Orkney and West Wales. Their main uses, judging by archibotanical surveys and historical records, were for drying partly or fully cleaned crops prior to storage, for dehusking barley and oats before milling, or for preparing malt for ale by roasting the sprouted grains of barley, wheat, including spelt, or, in the high medieval period, oats. In Wales, 22 of the 36 early medieval archaeobotanical samples, so nearly two-thirds, show processed, that's to say cleaned or semi-cleaned, crops, which is significant since not all published archaeobotanical reports provide this information. Possible malting activity was noted at six corn drying kilns. Four of these were Romano British. One was early medieval from South Hook, and one was undated from Parcubby, where most kilns date to the fifth to sixth century. Sprouted grain was observed at a further four corn drying kilns, where it was linked to crop spoilage. Sprouted grain remains are fragile and what we see is almost certainly an underrepresentation of likely malting activity, particularly since ale is a staple of early medieval food rents. And here I've given a breakdown of their contents. Looking at dominance, at what grains are present in largest numbers within individual assemblages, the 5th and 6th century contents are dominated overwhelmingly by barley with wheat, mainly spelt, having been the dominant crop up to the fourth century. Wheat is, however, present in all kilns at this time, albeit in smaller quantities. In the seventh century, when numbers of kilns start dropping dramatically, oats start to dominate, though wheat and barley are also present at many kilns, and this situation is maintained thereafter. These crop patterns are similar to those of Ireland, and the minimal Welsh evidence for rye has parallels in Ireland. These changing patterns raise questions, particularly in the context of the drop in numbers of kilns from the 7th century. Kiln contents may perhaps be indicating some particular pattern of 5th and 6th century use. The Roman period use of corn drying kilns has been linked to their use for malting, in using spelt. It is interesting, therefore, that barley, the, the grain of choice for many medieval brewers, takes over from wheat as the dominant grain in the 5th and 6th centuries. The change in contents thereafter, from barley to oats, combined with the drop in kiln numbers, may therefore indicate a reduction in large-scale brewing, linked perhaps to a reduction in feasting activity, as well as the increasing popularity of oats, which copes well with cool, damp growing conditions and was, by the 12th century, the default grain for bread if wheat was not available. Incidentally, the steep 7th century decline in corn drying hill numbers mirrors the decline in dated hillfort sites, and, as mentioned last week, Andy Seaman and I are currently looking at this. Locations are another topic that needs further work. The presence of a corn drying hill indicates a scale of crop processing beyond that of the single household, since at a domestic level, their functions can be performed with a pan over the hearth. 
They are therefore effectively indicators of social complexity, and in Ireland, associations with the state centres are noted. Large-scale activity is reflected in the multiple kilns that are present at some sites, sometimes showing activity over different periods. They are not usually found close to other buildings, apart from at South Hook, and this may reflect the risk of fire that they pose. Most were probably only used a few times a year at most. Some are located in cemetery areas, and there's a useful discussion of these in a new paper by Marian Shiner in Oxford Journal of Archaeology. Details are on the slide. I'm currently investigating the locational attributes of the 5th, 7th century kiln sites, which are shown on this slide. There are 11 sites for this period, and they account for 26 of the 42 early medieval kilns. And there are another eight undated kilns at these sites that, on typological grounds, are also likely to be of the same date. These sites all have central zone and assembly type indicators. And it being work in progress, I won't say much more now. Associations with the state centres are identified by Heather James in her excellent account of the landscape settings of the corn drying kilns found during work on the South Wales gas pipeline. This passes through a number of estates recorded in the Llandaff charters. 24 kilns in all were found here, seven of them with early medieval dates that follow the national picture. These estate centre associations should be seen within the context of the polyfocal central zones discussed last week, and I'm going to conclude with a case study published in this year's Medieval Settlement Research Journal. It concerns a polyfocal central zone at Bayville near Nevin in Pembrokeshire, which I identified in the course of my PhD research, using multidisciplinary sources since there was little firm archaeological evidence for the early medieval period. I'd also looked at medieval agricultural practices here, and I was interested when excavation of a Bronze Age ring fort turned up a corn drying kiln in the area of a medieval bondsman's hamlet. The excavators assumed that this kiln was medieval on the basis of its grain assemblage, lots of barley, some identifiable as hulled six row barley, and smaller amounts of oats and of wheat, which included spelt and an intermediate pre-threshing type. MSRG gave me funding for radio uh, carbon dating of two barley and oat samples, and the dating for both came back as 5th to 6th century. This was a bit of a surprise, though with the benefit of hindsight, the presence of the spelt should perhaps have alerted me to this possibility. It was the difficulty of identifying the context for these surprisingly early dates that, for me, provided the impetus for compiling the Gazetteer, and which led to the identification of the 5th to 6th century peak in kiln use. The form of a kiln, pear-shaped, turned out to be a common one for this period, and the barley-rich assemblage was also entirely typical. The kiln contents tell us that people here were growing spring-sown cereals, barley and oats, in winter manured infields, given the presence of weed seeds associated with spring sowing and nitrogen enriched soils. Spelt is usually regarded as an autumn sown crop and may have been grown on temporarily enclosed, that's to say folded areas of outfield. There are references to this practice in Roman sources. The plan shows the corn drying kiln within the context of the surrounding polyfocal central zone, which spreads over an area of some four kilometers. Early medieval evidence locally is provided by two Ogham stones and a couple of radiocarbon dates from enclosed settlements of an apparently minor type. We have archaeological evidence of a high status residence here at Castell Hentlis in the late prehistoric and Romano British periods, but for the early medieval period, we only have some pre Norman Heath place names. The corn drying kiln is therefore significant for its dating evidence and for the signals that it provides of particular types of activity associated with estate centres. Large-scale processing of grain supplied in food rents, which, given the period, was probably for local consumption, in the form of food and drink. In other words, a very possible indicator of feasting activity. So, summing up, I have tried to give you some sense of the key points of a quite detailed survey, and there's more information in the published paper. I've summarized them here and I'll read the list. So corn drying kilns provide 
information about crops, agricultural practice and diet, and their locational indicators for state center and polyfocal central zones. They're used to prepare grain for storage, milling and malt making. There's little evidence for their use for wet harvests or for the eighth century intensification of activity. On excavations, it's important to record areas of scorching and if possible, obtain two short life radiocarbon dates for every kiln. More work is needed on superstructure evidence and operation, for example, capacity. There's lots of potential for archaeobotanical research and experimental archaeology. And data is needed to update the gazetteer. Please send it to me. My email address is given on the screen. Thank you.